Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us, as we always do on Mondays, Professor Satyajit Rath, and we'll be discussing a good news for our viewers that we have a new vaccine which is available to Indians, particularly also to age group of 12 to 18 among children. We have a new vaccine which is available now to youngsters also, 12 to 18 age group, the Zydus Cadilla D vaccine. Satyajit, this is the first DNA vaccine in the world. What is a DNA vaccine and how does it, how is it different from the mRNA vaccines we've been hearing about, which is essentially, I presume, are RNA vaccines? So um, we've discussed this over the past year, Prameer, um, that when we make a vaccine, we are essentially taking a protein of the virus and showing that protein to the immune system so that it can make antibodies against it. And there are two ways that we can show the protein to the immune system. One is make the protein in the test tube or in the manufacturing process, um, such as with the Bharat Biotech Covaxin or the Novavax uh, va protein vaccine, mix it with a little adjuvant and put it into the body. The other category is to put the genetic information code for the vaccine into the body, uh, for the protein into the body and let the genetic code for the protein be read by the body so that the body makes the protein, the target protein of the virus and also responds to it. Now, in that second category where we inject the genetic code of the virus protein, we currently had so far two ways of injecting the genetic code. Remember the so-called central dogma of biology, which is that proteins are coded in the DNA and then the code is read first into an RNA and then the RNA is trans translated into a protein. So one successful set of vaccines, the NIH Moderna and the BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccines are actually RNA, mRNA is simply messenger RNA, RNA packaged and injected so that when it's injected, it gets into cells and is directly translated by cellular machineries into virus protein. That's the RNA or the mRNA uh, vaccine. The other genetic code vaccine uh, platform that we've been familiar with is the adenovirus vector based platform where the genetic code for the COVID-19 target, the spike protein genetic code is put into a, an adenovirus sequence. The adenovirus is made and the adenovirus itself functions as the carrier of the genetic code. When it is put into the body, it gets into cells and then all its proteins are made, including the COVID-19 relevant target protein that we are talking about. And this is what happens with the Oxford AstraZeneca Serum Institute Covishield. It's also what happens with the Gamalia Institute uh, Sputnik V and Sputnik Light vaccines and so on, as also the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The third way of doing it is a sort of in-between. You're going to just inject the genetic code rather than any adenovirus carrier, but the genetic code consists of the DNA rather than the RNA. And that's what the Zydus Cadilla vaccine, the so-called Zykov D consists of. Um, it's, it's the DNA level genetic code of the um, COVID-19 spike protein target. And that's injected with enough information there for the cells of the body again to take up the uh, DNA that's injected and to first make RNA from it and then to make protein from it. So these are really small technical variations. The advantages and disadvantages seem so far 
to vary so much that nothing very definitive about a given platform by way of advantage or disadvantage can be said. Um, but is it a different uh, platform technology? Is it a different manufacturing technology? Absolutely, yes. And is it a first time? Absolutely, yes. Although the DNA packaging is on license from, um, I think, an American small startup. What's called the plasmid sort of, which carries the uh, DNA into the body. A uh, quick question for you here, that when we talk about the DNA vaccine, one of the advantages which has been talked about is the fact that it is stable at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade and does not need the very high uh, refrigeration, minus 72, minus 80 degrees centigrade, which the mRNA vaccines require. Therefore, this is much more appropriate for a large number of countries than what the mRNA vaccines could be. Absolutely. And, and, and that's a clear advantage of these so-called plasmid DNA based um, vaccines. Although the packaging technology is again the same sort of lipid and related technology the, the, that, that uh, Zydus Cadilla has licensed from um, somebody. But the storage temperature issue is an absolutely uh, clear distinction between the DNA vaccine and the RNA vaccine so far. However, set against that are two points in the actual vaccination campaign uh, context the first is this is a three dose vaccine it's not even a two dose vaccine so uh, zero time four weeks later and eight weeks later is the current vaccination schedule now you will recollect that even the two dose vaccines have been subject to an enormous amount of implementation logistics confusion and difficulties imagine just how much more trouble a three dose vaccine is going to be so that's one issue a second issue is that is a, is is a little more interesting technologically this is a needle free vaccine yes um but it's still an injected vaccine so is is this an advantage yes it is in what sense it, is it an advantage well the needle causes more pain this is relatively um, less painful as an injection and number two um, the needle stick can introduce infections and this uh, has a much lower chance of infection set against that it requires a specialized technology which means that if you if we are going to do this on a large scale then the additional um, ancillary supply chain and distribution chain and the logistics of a, an injector instrument for the vaccination campaign will need to be worried about. So the three dose component and the injector are both going to be special difficulties, exactly like the storage temperature and the painless vaccination are going to be advantages. Other interesting issue that I was looking at is when you look at the figures, these are comparable to what I would say the Oxford AstraZeneca figures are in terms of uh, protective immunity or whatever we can call it. And it seems to be lower than the mRNA vaccines. Now, are they really apple to apple comparable or is that, are these figures just basically artifacts of the experiments that we are doing in terms of clinical trials. So um, I've been saying this for very many months to the point of boredom now, that unless a, a, a planned comparison is made, comparing numbers from independent trials really doesn't mean anything. And let me use the Zydus Cadilla example to give specific instances of that. In the first place, their trial has been over the, these past few months, which means that in quite likely um, probability, they, that this vaccine has been dealing with a lot of the Delta variant. That's correct. All the other vaccines were tested last year. Uh, so this is pre-Delta variant time, number one. Number two, if you look at the press release, so far we are just dealing with press release information. But if you look at the press release, the press release says that mild symptomatic infection showed a 66 point something percent um, protective efficacy. But it says without actually giving total numbers, 
Nonetheless, it says there were no cases of moderate to severe um, infection in the vaccinated group, which they in the press release are claiming as complete protection against moderate to severe um, illness. So if you look at all of this, as far as I can see, this vaccine falls in exactly the same category from these claims, not from independent peer reviewed publications, but from a publicity claim, it falls in the same category as all the other vaccines broadly fall in. Unless we have actual comparison studies, we won't be able to go much beyond that. But I think we can be certain that severe illness, disease and death will be as well protected against by this vaccine as by all the other vaccines, which is an extremely uh, useful addition to the COVID-19 um, portfolio of instruments. As you've discussed earlier, so the, what is the criteria for moderate? What's the criteria for minor? These are all issues of English, which translated into concrete terms, makes apple to apple comparison, as Dr. Ratu said, much more difficult. So it is when you have a common set of protocols, then you can really argue that, yes, we are comparing. When it's a different set of protocols done by different sets of people, with facing different conditions of the pandemic, all of this makes this comparisons rather difficult. All we can say is at the moment, all vaccines protect against severe illness and possibility of death. And at the moment, hospitalization is what all of them seem to prevent quite successfully. And that's what really matters to society, not the fact that you might be ill. And of course, when we talk about being not severely ill, that is not subjective in terms of that you're feeling bad, you're really sick, but in terms of the essentially what doctors would see in terms of your lung damage, etc., etc., your oxygenation of the blood, not that you are feeling sick as a dog, which could still happen, but that doesn't mean that you're seriously ill. And as we know, uh, people also have different reaction to different symptoms. Some are laid down completely by a simple headache, others can go around saying we are not we are, we're not sick even when they're quite according to other medical criteria might be considered sick so these are all the reasons we make all the uh, shall we say riders to our dis discussions here that when you compare you really cannot compare apple to apple in this particular way the other part of it is this 12 to 18 year olds being also that it could be given to them what makes this vaccine different from the other vaccines? Is it because they included children much earlier? What is the reason? That's all there is. That's all there is. That's really all there is. Um, keep in mind, Prabir, that um, uh, uh, this issue of safety that we've discussed repeatedly, all the current platforms, none of which are proper live vaccine platforms, and are therefore safe, safe for in all likelihood, pretty much for everybody, for the immunocompromised, for the pregnant, for the children, for everybody. Nonetheless, public policy should not depend on the immunologists' uh, speculations about likelihood of safety. It should depend on actual evidence and data. And uh, children, uh, teenagers have been included, and therefore, it is appropriate to license it for children. I'm I repeat again, we've been saying in, on this forum for quite some time that all the other vaccines should have been tested against these specialized um, risk groups and categories long back. Um, they are currently so being tested and as the data come in, they will also be uh, approved for children, you know, progressively younger and younger children. So this is, there's nothing special about this vaccine. It's simply that the data seem to be available. Again, we haven't actually seen the data. The other part of it, which is that scaling up theoretically, and this I repeat theoretically, is easier because you are not really looking at a co-vaccine kind of scenario where you're dealing with the actual active virus, which you have to inactivate. Therefore, your biosafety levels and all the care you need to take needs to be higher. You have to see the virus really inactivated. Compared to this, multiplication of the vaccine, basically, 
is relatively easier, scaling it up is relatively easier, and also handling it in biosafety terms is relatively easier. So that gives us some advantage of thinking that it might be scaled up faster. So um, uh, you bring up an interesting point. Um, everything you said, I agree with. So I'm, I'm going to add a couple of caveats that might be of interest. Number one, absolutely, there are no biosafety issues with this vaccine, unlike with growing the whole live virus as infectious virus and then inactivating it, which is the Covaxin situation. But remember what I said about the three platforms, the mRNA, the DNA, and the adenovirus. The mRNA is really um, a rapid turnover manufacturer, but it requires a great deal of specialized ancillary supply chains um, for at, at the industrial manufacturing level. So for it to scale up, as we've discussed earlier, is uh, more plausible in the global north than in the global south. The adenovirus is completely plausible in the global south, but you will remember that the adenoviral um, vaccine manufacturing batch technologies have had batch failures resulting in delays of supplies and, and the famous uh, dispute between AstraZeneca and the European Union, for example, um, was, was one such. Delays in the Janssen, Johnson, Johnson vaccine also appeared to have been uh, at some point because of batch failure delays. This technology grows plasmid DNA in bacterial cultures rather than in actual um, uh, human cell cultures, which are industrially much more robust. Uh, industrially, there is much greater familiarity. And therefore, in a sense, the plasmid DNA technology may, I, I say, we need to see actual evidence, but may be plausibly far more robust than any of the other technologies for scale up. Now, um, we still have to keep in mind that this is still a three dose vaccine with, with an injector. And we have to keep in mind that what Zydus Cadilla seems to be promising at the moment as a supply quantum is one crore <laughs> doses. And one crore doses is really just complete immunization for 30 lakh people, 33 lakh people. Yes. Uh that's quite right. They have, of course, promised that by December, they'll be able to scale it up more. But the numbers promised are quite modest given the scale of our needs. So yeah. I was going to come to this point, which you have already brought us, that unless there is a really an investment of some kind, which is larger than what they seem to be planning, scaling up this is not going to be that simple. Apart from, as you put it, getting the supply chain working for a new instrument to inject the vaccine and for having three doses, being able to coordinate all of that with the two months, one, zero, 28, 56, whatever that way it is done. And that's not simple for a complex, large vaccine campaign like ours, which is where we seem still to be stuck, the speed at which we are vaccinating does not seem to be commensurate with the promises made. And by the, at, as of date, we are still below 10% in terms of people having received two doses. Thank you very much, Satyajit, for being with us, explaining the details to our viewers. And for those who watch NewsClick regularly, please do visit us. Also, come and visit our website.